to wake up every single day for that long and know that you're just one signature away from freedom and to have that kind of, um, I mean, the, the, the sheer sort of um, mental toughness to do that was extraordinary. So I think in the West, and, and I have to say among whites in particular, the basis, the sort of emotional basis for um, for the, the affection and esteem in which Mandela was held was sort of based on relief that here was a man who had been oppressed and imprisoned, etc., etc., but who was quite prepared to come out and forgive. In South Africa, especially among black South Africans, it's something slightly different, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, he, he was a hero to black South Africans. Um, most of whom, by the time he came out, didn't know him because he was an old man by the time he came out. But it always struck me that you know, Mandela was a bit like Washington. He came out, and he, George Washington, that is, and he'd served one term, one presidential term, four years, and then retired, walked away. And our, in Africa, of course, our experience has, been, has not been that, by and large. What tends to happen is that liberation leaders in Africa, they, they, they fight a liberation war, freedom fighters, they become the first president, and then they become president for life, and they get morphed into some kind of authoritarian um, leadership. That's what happens. And it's based on the, the legitimacy, the authenticity of being the leader that has fought and delivered freedom. And that's happened all the way across the continent, um, uh, in, in various forms, from, from benign to not benign, but, but essentially have been anti-democratic. And Mandela's main legacy, I think, to South Africa going forward was that if ever there was a, there was a leader in, in Africa and indeed the world who was in a position to create a cult and to be a president for life and to stay on and to get the constitution amended, etc., etc., it was Nelson Mandela. And yet he didn't even do a second term, which he could have done quite legitimately. And so South Africa is now on its fourth president. Now, whatever you think of the quality of these presidents, and they've been very mixed, the, the very fact is that we have this precedent of changing leaders so that we don't have the one big man. And that the ANC, of course, is still in power. So that's going to be the big test going down the road, is whether, at what point, the ANC, if it loses an election, will be prepared to go into opposition. Uh, there's the general consensus is they certainly won't lose the election that's coming up this year. There's an election due uh, somewhere between April and July, and this will be the first election in which the so-called born threes, the kids who were born after the end of apartheid, will vote. Um, and I think that you know there has been there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the aid of the ruling ANC in terms of service delivery and in terms of their efficiency, in terms of people being um, annoyed at the, the rising levels of corruption. But while Mandela was alive, there was this enormous residual loyalty to the aid even though Mandela was long retired. And so it'll be interesting to see what effect his death will have on the, on the ANC's sort of authority in, as, as the Liberation Party. So, but in a way, given who Nelson Mandela was and, you know, and what he would say for the ANC going forward is uh, Death, Nelson Mandela, who can be become a portrait on the wall and all in the way the Congress in India has done to its uh, heroes, be sort of more useful than Nelson Mandela, who might speak his mind. It's a very interesting point. I mean, the, 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 the sort of iconography of the dead leader, whether that becomes almost more potent because you can you can start you can finish the sort of whole process of political sainthood and canonization. I mean, I think the fact that Mandela while he was still alive, but after he retired, started, although he was very loyal to the whole idea of the ANC, which, remember, is, was Africa's oldest liberation movement and was 100 years old. Um, uh, and he was, very, he was very much a sort of party man in that sense and wouldn't criticize it publicly. But privately, he was making remarks, many of which are now in the archives and being released, um, which show that he was very dissatisfied with, with a number of um, things done by the, by the ANC leadership. And there is, I mean, you're absolutely right, there's a big sort of struggle at the moment about 
who Nelson Mandela belongs to. Does Nelson Mandela belong to the whole country? Because after all, that was his shtick. He was about unifying the country, including whites, Afrikaners, so-called colored Indians, all the different minorities, um, including other other black tribes other than his own Tosa tribe, the Zulu tribe, which is the biggest in the tribe, that he was a sort of man for all seasons, a man for all regions, or whether the ANC said, no, 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 he's, he's ours. And that battle has been played out now in the South African media. It has a very, um, a, a very uh, sort of lively media with, with um, a critical media. Um, and it's playing out and will play out in the next few months and years. Um, to come from Mandela to Mugabe, um, your book on the fear about Mugabe, one of the things you said that when Mandela came out of prison, he joked that, you know, until that point, Mugabe had been sort of the colossus on, in African politics. And Mandela joked that Mugabe had grown accustomed to being the star, and then the sun came out. And uh, what was the relationship between the two of them? I mean, not particularly good. And certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm astonished sometimes to see the, 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 the lack of. I mean, you, you'll still see now in places that ought to know better, you'll see in op ed pieces and sort of um, uh, and editorials um, ex explanations as to why South Africa, why the ANC appears to have protected Mugabe for so long and to have been. Um, to have enabled Mugabe to continue. So, I mean, just to briefly bring you up to date, Mugabe, Mugabe was Zimbabwe's first president, and he came to power in 1980, and he's still there. He turns 90 years old uh, next month in February, um, and he's um, and he the last two elections, in fact, probably the last three elections, by by everything we can so far as there's any transparency at all, have been rigged, both been rigged and there's been enormous violence. So, uh, and South Africa, Zimbabwe depends overwhelmingly on South Africa in all sorts of ways, from, tr from trade routes to, to everything else. Um, and if, the, if there had been the political will in South Africa to restore democracy to Zimbabwe, it would, have, it would have happened, and they haven't done it. And you see these editorials saying, oh, it's because the ANC owes Mugabe a debt, uh, for his help during the during the end of the war against apartheid. So if you bear in mind that um, Zimbabwe becomes independent in 1980 and apartheid persists for another 12 or 13 years essentially, during which time these editors will tell you, you know, Mugabe is indeed the chairman of the frontline states and he is he is um, he's, he's sort of championing the cause against apartheid. And of course that was his big enabling thing. It was impossible while he was doing that. It's very difficult to criticize Mugabe without appearing to be an apologist for apartheid. Do you see what I mean? Because he, because he was, you know, he, he was on the international stage as sort of an African leader of the anti-apartheid movement. But he didn't do very in real in real life. He did very little to um, to actually help. I mean, for example, he didn't allow any um, incursions by guerrillas by the Mkhonto Sizwe, the armed wing of the ANC, from Zimbabwe into South Africa. Whereas both Mozambique and Botswana allowed that and paid the price. Um, and that, of course, they weren't aligned when they were both liberation movements because they were, they, they, they both had, I mean, the way it worked was the South, that the ANC was aligned to Zarko and Joshua and Como, and they were both um, supported by the, by the Russians. And Zarno Pierre, which was Mugabe's party, and the PAC, which was you know, Black Consciousness were both supported by the Chinese. So they were actually rivals during the Liberation War. So that's my, my theory as to why South African uh, governments, why the ANC has protected Mugabe, is that um, all, of the, all of the countries, and if we just keep it to Southern Africa, all of the countries in Southern Africa that fought um, liberation wars uh, for freedom to, to, to ditch colonialism to become um, democratic, um, all of those countries, the liberation um, movement that won the first elections and that fought for freedom is still in power in all of those places. So if you look, if you start the MPLA in Angola, Zana PF in Zimbabwe, Frelimo in Mozambique, the ANC in South Africa, and Swapo in Namibia, they're all still in power. They may have changed presidents, but, but, but the party hasn't changed. 
and it's not in the interests of any of these liberation party governments to see any of the other ones be tossed out of power because it, it establishes a precedent that you can do this. Now, there have been other, other regime changes in southern and central Africa, but, but not, not in countries where a real liberation war is being fought. And then that's the big difference. And I was struck when I was working for the BBC, I remember doing a documentary in Cuba, and I was struck by the similarity between Cuba and Zimbabwe in terms of the, the um, uh, elevation of the revolution as this, you know, this, um, the, the, the kind of founding mythology of the nation, and that the, the, the party that has liberated the country, it's, without them you wouldn't have a vote. So how can you possibly vote them out of power? Right. Uh, one of the things you've reported on was extensively is on Zimbabwe under Mugabe and uh, you know the, the things that we see most often in the paper, the fight for the land, the, of the war with the and the war with um, so Could you just describe for the audience what that feeling of siege is like? Because you, you, you talk to people about so many different farms and then looking out at these guys pressing in. So the land situation in, in Zimbabwe is again one of those things that appears to be one thing from the outside and then like so many things, the closer you get to it, the more complicated it gets and, and the, the sort of simplistic um, analysis that falls away into irritatingly complicated things. But essentially from the outside, it, it, you know, a few white farmers um, owned a disproportionate amount of land, these commercial farms. and. Um, but they carried on owning them from 1980 all the way through to 2000. So for 20 years, under the Mugabe regime, under you know what was essentially a socialist government um, in name at least, these white commercial farmers were allowed to continue. Um, and that in fact, they were the linchpin of the economy. They employed more people than anybody else. Um, and Zimbabwe doesn't it doesn't have oil like Nigeria. It's not a resource-based economy. It's a mixed economy. And, and agriculture was sort of the, the linchpin of it. And there was, there was always enormous criticism of, of this, that there should be, and, and in fact, even the white farmers themselves began to feel more and more insecure and realized there needed to be land reform. And there was some land reform. C certain land was given over, but not enough. And there were many, many different plans as to what could be done. But then in 2000, very suddenly, these, um, the land was invaded. And it wasn't invaded in a kind of, um, this wasn't just some a sort of spontaneous uprising. It, people arrived in government trucks and buses and army trucks and things, peasants came onto the farms and drove not just the white farmers off, but the black farm workers off as well. And, um, and the farms, by and large, were, were redistributed, but in a very chaotic way, with no planning at all, and agricultural um, uh, output just absolutely plummeted in all respect and the economy collapsed. It, so, uh, it collapsed so profoundly that it is, I believe, the fastest decline, the fastest contraction of an economy in the peacetime, of an economy in peace. It, it, you know, you'll see economies um, contracting that quickly during times of war, but not during times of peace. Um, the, the Zimbabwe dollar collapsed, it got so bad that eventually the Zimbabwe dollar was Halving in value every 24 hours. It was um, the, 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 the sort of amusing story that people tell about this. There was um, there's rather a good um, golf club in the golf course in Harare. I think it's still called the Royal Harare Golf Course. And the pub there inevitably is called the 19th Hole. And um, what people would do is go there before the game instead of after the game and order and pay for their drinks because by the time they've done 18 holes, the drinks have doubled in price. I mean, it was it was it was worse than the Weimar Republic. It was an extraordinary, and 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 I mean, it was you know, Zimbabwe became a failed state almost overnight. It just went over a precipice, and and it was up until then. Bear in mind, I mean, you know, it was a tragedy in the sort of classic Greek sense of the word, in that you see it coming, you know it's coming, and yet it still comes. It's still you know, even though everybody sees it happening, somehow it still plays out. So. Um, uh, and the, the real story behind it, again, was sort of nothing to do with um, the whites per se. I mean, there was genuine reason to reform the land. The real reason behind it was that 
that Mugabe realized he was going to lose that election. I mean, there'd be opposition building and building a big new opposition party had launched the year before. And the biggest trade union in the country was the Agricultural Workers uh, Union, um, which was the linchpin of the opposition. And the, his, the real target in the, in the drive to, um, to take over the white farms was the black farm workers. And so they were all thrown off the pipes in, in an attempt to break, to break them up. So, and, and many of those farm workers had originally, two or three generations before, come from neighboring states, from Malawi, from Zambia, from Mozambique. Um, and once they were kicked off the farms, they had nowhere to go. They had no sort of home area to go to. And they effectively were disenfranchised. They lost their vote. One of the differences in decolonization that happened in places in Zimbabwe and happened in places like India, from the friend they mentioned that in Africa, many of the former, the, the descendants of the former colonial power got to stay on, whereas in places in Asia, they just left. And is that the source of the friction and everything going forward? I mean, in fact, there were very few settler economies and um, countries in Africa. They were really, they were. There were the two um, Portuguese countries, Angola and Mozambique, um, and there was um, Zimbabwe, to a lesser extent Kenya, um, and essentially South Africa, which had the longest continuous uh, white um, settlement based on the, on the so-called Afrikaners who came in with the Dutch East India Company. So, so I mean, Africa is 53 countries. So, as a whole, you know, countries, huge countries like Nigeria, there were was was administered in a similar way to India. There was sort of expatriate British kind of colonial office people, but very few of them. And the Brits, the Brits tended to, in Africa, I mean, the, the Brits tended, to, and I'm only simplifying a little bit here, to come into a country and to look around and ask the question, who's the second most powerful chief? And then someone would say, it's this guy here. Then they would go to him and say, how would you like to be the first most powerful chief? And then, so that they were, you know, rather than just, and, 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 and they would do it through manipulating the power structures. They would find out enough, rather than by sheer force of arms. So, somewhere like Nigeria, at the height of colonialism, it's a huge, burgeoning country with millions and millions of people, and very small armies sitting there. I mean, they were, which is not to say they weren't acts of violence, etc. Of course they were, but, but it, was done, it was done through a sort of, you know, a, a, a manipulation more than, more than just sheer force. So the places which did have bigger white settlements, they played out, as you say, in a slightly different way. What happened with the Mozambique colonies, um, if you recall, it's a long time ago, I think I'm right in saying that the, the Portugal was ruled by um, dictators and, uh, through to the 70s, and I think in 1974 they, had, they, they were overthrown. And so suddenly those two, the Portuguese colonies, were just um, shed very, very quickly. And in Mozambique and Angola, the, the, the Portuguese settlers, 98% of them left overnight, and um, they just poured out. And indeed, both those colonies, the, the economies of both those countries, collapsed in, in the immediate. Um, most of them, a lot of them went down to South Africa, and some of them went back to, to, to Portugal. And I think, you know, race, race is useful. I mean, it's, it's useful if you're a dictator, if you're an authoritarian ruler in Africa, it can be quite useful to have a small, a small economically privileged um, minority um, that you can kind of, you can use at election time and things. I mean, and bear in mind that Mugabe was very um, reconciliatory towards the whites right up until 2000. In his first cabinet, he, he had white ministers in it, minister of agriculture, he was actually, was a, was a, was a white person. And the whites did very well for, 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 for 20 years, the whites did perfectly well. I remember getting in trouble with the white farmers um, when Mugabe sent his North Korean trained 5th Brigade from the, from the military into the south of the country, Matsubishi land, um, and they committed these terrible massacres, the Matsubishi land massacres. We still don't know how many people were killed. Probably, you know, between 10 and 20,000 civilians were killed. Um, and I started writing pieces about it and agitating about it and whatever. And white farmers, when I would meet them, would come, would upbraid me and say, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you causing trouble? It's nothing to do with us. You, know, you, you should just leave it alone. It's the tribes just, you know, 
sorting out historical grievances amongst themselves has nothing to do with us. Fast forward 20 years when I was reporting that, and then the white farmers were coming up to me and saying, please write, write about what's happening to us and how we're being, you know, and I said, uh, excuse me, 20 years ago when we were doing, you know, 15 years before when we were when I was writing about the massacre the massacres, we said, oh, it's just a minority tribe. Don't, you know, why are you causing trouble? So, you know, what goes around comes around. But in that sense, you know, is it that obviously something like reconciliation at the end of the, uh, some kind of a colonial experience is great for the former colonial power because it's kind of like wiping the plate clean so all the friends now will kind of try and get along together. But uh, that's not, you know, can you claim, can the white state claim that as something that should happen or is it like totally dependent on the former colony whether they want to fist out that as a I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, in South Africa, where apartheid was so hermetic, if the segregation was so complete, I mean, to a ridiculous extent, um, whites just didn't really know blacks. The only blacks they ever met were the servants in their own household. And I remember, you know, when you talked about the idea of majority rule, white South Africans thought they would say, you know, my garden is not capable of being prime minister. You know, they had no concept of an educated black class. They, they never met educated blacks. They never, they didn't go to school with them. They barely went to university with them. It just didn't exist. And that was the big problem there. It's just, you know, when you have segregation that's so complete, there's, there's fear based on ignorance. Zimbabwe, or Rhodesia rather, as it was, the segregation wasn't nearly as hermetic because it was smaller and because it wasn't it wasn't quite as um, it wasn't quite as oppressive. Um, and one of the main things, I mean, the thing that I think saved me, for example, growing up in, in Rhodesia, was that I went to multiracial schools all my life, church church schools, which were in every other way Dickensian and awful, and you got beaten all the time and whatever. But but in one crucial way, were very progressive, which was that they were multiracial. Um, and so, when you get it, when you educate people, when you put kids together and just educate them together, you know, they they, they get to know each other. Um, and that didn't exist in South Africa. I think that um, the race thing can become um, a sort of irrelevance quite quickly. I mean. In, in South Africa, for example, you know, what you see is not what you get. So you look at the ANC and you think, here's the ANC, it's a strident liberation party or whatever. And actually it's not at all. It's made you know, all sorts of deals with, with, with big capital, you know, the private sector and whatever. And it's quite a kind of, if you look at what it's actually done, it's somewhat conservative in many respects. And what they're trying to do in South Africa is this thing called black economic empowerment where they've tried to move, you know, move resources across. And of course it's been it's very easy to get around it and to, 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 to pay off people and things, and that's been, that has been a problem, a problem in South Africa. I personally, I think that you know, there are so few whites left in Zimbabwe, and there are probably somewhere between 10 and 20,000 whites left in Zimbabwe, that it's sort of completely irrelevant. And in South Africa... But do you think Mugabe needs those whites yeah, there? Yeah, you know, I mean, I remember thinking to some extent when he... I mean, if you saw... The, the headlines in the in the government supporting newspaper, the Herald, um, talking about whites and things. It was getting very. Um, I mean, it looked incredibly dangerous. In fact, you know, the fact when the, when the white farms were taken over, very few white farmers were killed. I mean, you know, a dozen or twenty or something over that sort of first year or two. But it 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 sort of reminded me in its tone. I mean, it's sort of the way that Jews in, in, in Europe had always been insecure because they, you know, especially in countries where they were doing well, in Germany and places, that they were a small, um, identifiable, you know, that they, they were interlopers, they'd come from somewhere else. And at times of economic depression, at times when, you know, you had a populist leader who wanted, they were easy to focus on as a thing. And so there was, there was that. But I don't, I mean, I think, you know, having said that, being a, even though I'm a white African, I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think white Africans have had a terrible year. I mean, the by and large, they've sort of been, you know, I mean, in South Africa, you go, they're still, they're still, you know, swimming pools and large dorms and, you know, 
and that they're doing pretty fine. Uh, in fact, I wanted to quote, uh, I think it was from the VR reference, but it was from uh, this book, um, about the, what it means to be a white African. And, and you, you, you're at an airport or something, and you're reading about a farm killing in the newspaper, and there's a Congolese businessman who's sitting next to you trying to look and see what you're reading and uh, quote him. You say, and you see in his eyes an expression that you have recognized at first. And then you realize it's pity. It's for the farmer, for you and your little tribe of white Africans. And you write, I feel embarrassed, humiliated, mortified. I'm not used to being the one being pity. I'm the one who pity others. And I think that, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's still one of the big problems that the West, and especially Western countries that have a history of colonialism, that they have in the way that they deal with the developing world and with countries that were previously colonies. In that, I think that we are used to being, to having starring roles on the stage. And it's the point that we almost don't mind if we're the heroes or the villains, as long as we have a starring role. Or the, what we don't want to be is just to be relegated to some sort of bit part. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's this kind of hubris of the, the pomposity of, of kind of thinking that we can, you know, invade this country and fix this and do that or whatever. And, you know, it's difficult to realize that actually, you know, for the West to sort of change its, its, its whole historical attitude to, to the rest of the world and realize that you know, we don't necessarily play a starring role in other countries' melodramas. And, and, and there was a phrase that you used to describe what, which I had not learned until I read your book, was about how white Africa, or the, were, what they were called in South Africa. So, yeah, so, I mean, so well, I mean, you know, a, a lot of what, a lot of what, it's strange, you know, writing, I mean, I grew up in, mostly in Zimbabwe, mostly, but principally in Zimbabwe, and I've written this trilogy of, accidental trilogy of memoirs, um, which is ostensibly cited mostly in Zimbabwe, a small landlocked country that's of no strategic importance, and et cetera, et cetera. But really, what one's mining these situations for universals, they're not really just about the sort of, you know, they're not really about the politics of the place. They're about the idea of home and identity and belonging and all of these sort of universal resonances that we all have, whether we live in, you know, whether we cite them in I don't know, rural Pennsylvania, like Updike, or, you know, anywhere at all. You're not really writing just about these places. And I always have this sort of sense when I'm writing a book that I've got two, two, these two disparate readers on, on, on either end of the spectrum. And the one reader is someone who literally doesn't know where Zimbabwe is, and frankly, couldn't care less. And the other one is someone who knows an awful lot about it and thinks they know everything about it. So how do you write in such a way as to engage both of these readers without boring one rigid or confusing and bewildering the other one? What, how do you do it? And the, the, the kind of irony, the, the anomaly, the paradox of it is that you would imagine that you write about it by sort of pulling back and sort of generalizing, but actually the, the the truth is in the detail, the universal is in the specific. So you sort of go in deep to actually pull back. And so, and I feel like if you if you can if you can describe something well enough, then the person who doesn't know about it, you paint a vivid enough word picture that they appreciate it. And the person who does know about it gets the thrill of recognition that they, they it, it, and you know what it's like when someone writes about something you know intimately and they get it right. It's a wonderful thing. And it also, you know, on, a, on, a, on a meta level, it's, it's about not being alone, that you realize that someone else has thought this, has been in this position, has seen this and whatever. So the strange thing in terms of, of um, home and belonging and identity and whatever, but, you know, I, I remember when my first book came out, Time magazine wrote a somewhat favorable review of it, but it had a picture of me looking, and it was a sort of, not a proper picture, and it made me look eyelided and, and whatever. And underneath it said, um, it said, um, Peter Godwin dash white African dash oxymoron question mark. Okay, so I mean, and so in a sense, 
this is what, you know, I think what the reason I've ended up being a writer, and I, I, I tended to notice that a lot of memoirists in particular, uh, um, they only really start writing about a place when they are removed from it, either in time or in place. They either physically move away or, you know, 20 years pass and the place they're writing about has changed completely. You sort of need that removed to get your focal legs on it. And um, growing up white in Africa was the most bizarre experience in a way, and you didn't, I didn't necessarily recognize it at the time at all, but I mean, we grew up in a rural area, I grew up speaking the local languages mostly, um, and we would send each other Christmas cards with sort of robins and holly and snowmen and stuff we'd never seen, you know. And, and so we had this sort of notional kind of, this notional culture that was completely, you know, it was midsummer during our Christmas. Um, and um, the, anyway, the other big difference between the, the white population in Zimbabwe and the white population in South Africa was the white population in Zimbabwe was, was primarily, you know, overwhelmingly English speaking. And most of the farmers in the Whereas um, in South Africa there was a big Afrikaans population. And they used to call us the Anglo the Anglo Africans, they had a nickname for us, which was they used to call us in Afrikaans soaked peel. And it, the, the translation for soaked peel is um, soat is salt and peel is penis. So they would call us salt penises. And they would call us salt penises because they would say we had one foot in Africa and one foot in Europe, and our penis was dangling in the ocean brine. <laughs> so, when you were, um, at what point did you get uh, declared an enemy of the state? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, so I had a, my, my mother was a doctor, and um, my father was uh, an engineer, and in this, uh, in, in the first book I wrote, the keyword, um, was a sort of coming of age memoir, and it was all about, my, my mother was the only doctor in more than a thousand square miles. She ran leper colonies and tuberculosis sanitarium and mass vaccinations. And she did all the first, you know, all the family planning work and et cetera, et cetera. And I would go out with her on an awful work and help her translate and things. And it was an amazing sort of upbringing. And then I went to these church schools and boarding schools. And what happened in white liberal families was that because there was conscription, because the war started in sort of late 1972 and slowly got more and more intense at the Liberation War, um, and all white males were conscripted, but you could get, um, you were allowed to do university first. If you, so we would all, like white liberal families, would send their sons to university overseas, and then we wouldn't come back, and that was sort of how it was done. And in the year that I finished my A levels, finished sixth form, and was about to go to Cambridge, they changed the law, and so I was I ended up in the in the army in the war for nearly two years, all in all. And then I went to university, and I eventually came back, um, uh, and I drifted into journalism. And I was one of the people who came back after 1980, and we were all very enthusiastic about what Zimbabwe could be. In this multiracial experiment would be this extraordinary place. And bear in mind that Zimbabwe, you know, for the first 10 years after independence, it had it had the highest um, li literacy rate in Africa, well up in the 90s, the most educated population, had the highest standard of living, had the best infrastructure. It was an extraordinary place that, that you know shattered all of your stereotypes, you know, one stereotypes about, about Africa. But very early on, much, you know, and, and Again, this is about how one trades in narratives that um, tend to be sort of not quite true. And the narrative, for example, with Mugabe, if you ask average people overseas, you know, what, what, what happened in Zimbabwe, what went wrong, they'd say, oh, well, Mugabe comes in in 1980, and everything goes swimmingly for about 20 years, and then in sort of 1990, 2000 years, a sudden Russia flood to the head, his, his first wife dies, and marries a new avaricious wife who, much, much younger, with whom he's already had two children, and um, they... Yeah. Husband, he posted off to China. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, uh, I think, Jahangir or somebody. Right. And, um, and they, they, you know, she, they called her the Imelda Marcos of Africa and all that, and she's, you know, she, and the, at that point, it all goes wrong, etc., etc. And that's, a, that's a, an appealingly simple narrative that one can immediately understand. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work, because Mass massacres were in 84, 
and yet nothing happened. So, you know, these troops go down, they kill huge numbers of people, and we wrote about it, you know, various of us were there and wrote about it, and nothing happened, not just in Zimbabwe, nothing happened in the UN, nothing happened from Britain, there were no, you know, aid wasn't cut, there was nothing at all. After the Matabina massacres, Mugabe gets given a, a knighthood and an honorary degree. He, he got an honorary award, award here. But it's like, he's a, but everybody just ignores this little thing that happens. And, and, then, and then it's only after 2000 that he goes off the right arms and things that he becomes the villain we all love to hate. You know, this is you know, years after what, you know, so for me, I go back in 1980 and I, to some extent, drunk the Kool Aid. You know, for me, this is, I've now been given a chance. I've been, you know, in, I've been conscripted into the war, I've fought on the wrong side of the losing war, I was, I was, you know, a remnant of colonial oppressors, but, and now I'm getting a chance to sort of reinvent myself and to go back and, you know, to go back to place, which I do. And it's all great. And then in 84, I see this, you know, I go down and see what's happening. Um, and I can't unsee it. And so for me, that was Mugabe's original sin. That was the sort of the thing, you know, that it's and also, you start to get an insight then into, into what the regime is really like. Um, and, and, and the reason nothing happens, if you look back on it, up until 1990, when the Berlin Wall falls and um, the Cold War ends, the West doesn't give a shit about how democratic or transparent Africa is. All they care about, and, so, and the East too, in Moscow and Washington, all they care about is do you support, you know, do you support Moscow or do you support Washington? And in the West, we're happy to support, you know, Mobutu and Zaire, one of the most corrupt leaders ever. We, you know, and, and Russia did the same. And there were certain leaders like Syed Barre in Somalia who, who went from one to the other, you know, getting getting aid from one to the other. So, so you know, we've got this whole legacy, the international system, that you know, the whole of if you think Africa starts becoming independent. 1957 with Ghana, it's the first one, and then very, very quickly through the late 50s and, and early to mid 60s, the rest of them go, and then these final, final ones, the Portuguese colonies, and then so on. But all of them, all of them, apart from South Africa, become independent during the Cold War, and it's a terrible time to become independent because, if, you know, the reason there are so many conflicts is because nobody cares about. It. And so, in South Africa, the, if there's one big advantage that South Africa got from becoming democratic so late, it's that it's the first African country to become independent and democratic post Cold War. So, what was it like for you uh, to be living in out in New York or somewhere, and your you know your parents are still there in Zimbabwe, aging? Um, growing frail in a country that feels like it's getting increasingly hostile and unaffordable in many ways. And you keep looking for ways to come to the continent on reporting trips and stuff. So you're trying to, you know, you're getting this gig to do a reporting a report on luxury vacations in South Africa or adventure tourism with the Victoria Falls or whatever. And you're actually coming to see a country in shambles and parents that you're going to have to leave behind at the end of the trip. Yes, I mean, in, in those terms, you know, what, I'm, what I was facing is what so many people face, which is, you know, what happens when parents become elderly and how you, what, how you deal with that situation and how, you, how they cope and, you know, the, when you become a sandwich generation, when you've got kids of your own and your parents are becoming frail and elderly. And instead of you know my parents being in kind of a condo in Florida, they were they were in a failed state in Africa and refused not only refusing to leave, which they adamantly did, um, but you know their their own the economic underpinning of their own lives, which you know, hitherto been very comfortable upper middle class lives, collapsed. And so in the middle, so I had written this earlier book, Makiwa, which sort of went up until sort of the early 90s, I suppose. And then um, I went I went back and I was writing, I started to write a book about the collapse of Zimbabwe because it was sort of so extraordinary. And in that book, for example, I mean, one of the metaphors for what happens to my parents is the swimming pool. So at the beginning of the book, my father is this very fastidious engineer. So, um, and my father, when I grew up, was this, um, you know, he would stride around the bush in a safari suit and a handlebar star 
are speaking in a kind of clipped British military accent with and wearing desert boots and um, uh, you know it was very sort of emotionally truculent Victorian part of familias and whatever you couldn't get anywhere close to him. and that was my father sort of you know a human a personal embodiment of colonialism if you could ever find one. Um, and so in the next book I'm sort of describing what happens to them. They've moved from the from the mostly border area into the town by then into the capital right? And they live in the northern suburbs in a sort of you know two acre property or whatever. And this swimming pool which my father has designed and built and he's very sort of anal about keeping it very clean and it's all fantastic. And then on subsequent trips, you know, there's no there's no electricity and then there's no running water and they can't get chlorine to keep it clean and the, the swimming pool deteriorates until you can't swim. And then they can't get food. So they start they start breeding fish. They plant reeds in the swimming pool and they start breeding fish in it. And my father sort of sits there with a net trying to kind of get these fish up so that we can have dinner, you know, and it's just it's sort of funny and yet sad all at the same time. And then by the end we're using the swimming pool water to flush the toilets because there's no running water. And so it's a sort of metaphor through the swimming pool of what happens. And this, you know, imagine if this is happening to an upper middle class family, what is happening to people who have nothing, you know, I mean, which, and so the other kind of, the other sort of metaphor, if you like, is that they've, the, the, the house is on a relatively main road, and my parents have a fence, and, and, and growing over the fence is a huge sisal um, bushes, you know, these sharp serrated leaves, and bougainvillea, whatever, it's, it's a barrier that keeps the third world out, and they're on this side. And the final thing for them is that, one, that on the other side of this fence, there are four cooks and a pen that's been selling the little thing on the little rickety wooden thing, selling to the, you know, and they, they can't get transport back to where they live, to the township, so they sleep there at night. So you lie in your bed in, this, in the big house, and, you know, 15 yards away, you can hear the kids coughing and mewling and whatever, they're right there. And then one day, the, in winter, they've got little fires to keep themselves warm. One of the fire um, catches into the hedge, and the whole thing burns down. And my parents used to have early morning tea up in the pergola, and we go there the next morning having failed to put the fire out, and we're having our little tea there, and then all the, pe all the, all the, um, all these impoverished people, the peddlers things, are all standing at the non-fence, just staring at my parents. Suddenly, these two worlds have just, you know, collided. And and and, it's, you know, and, my, and, and there's a, a scene in it where my mother eventually you know, takes some tea, and it's this sort of extraordinary moment where all of these people have all just sunk together, and in it they found their common humanity. You know, I, I wanted to open it up uh, for questions, but one thing that struck me while reading the book is, as you say, the last couple of elections have obviously been great. You know, the country is in shambles. People, you know, inflation is out of control. Why hasn't, you know, what what's happened in places like, you know, a, a Mubarak gets rattled by street demonstrations ultimately happened in so many different places. Why hasn't something similar to that happened in Zimbabwe, given that it's become patently clear over and over again that Robert Mugabe is not just going to, you know, play by the rules of cricket and retire? I mean, partly because the Zimbabwe police and army use live ammunition. It's not like you couldn't do Kiev, you know, you couldn't be doing Ukraine there because they'd just be, they'd be blood in the street. And partly, and I think this is more to the point really ultimately, is that Zimbabwe has such an educated population, you know, black and white, that people just leave. You know, that you can go to South Africa. It's very easy for Zimbabweans to go to South Africa. And so they've, they've, they've tended to, so Zimbabwe's got a much lower population, I mean, by some, accounts, you know, a third to a half of the population has, has, has now left. And I mean, just, you know, to bring the other story to the full circle, that in, in, the, um, in the second memoir that I was writing, in the middle of cataloguing everything collapsing, um, my father, as I say, being this sort of punctilious Brit, had a heart attack and I thought he was, um, thought he was gonna die. And, he, he tells me, in the middle of this book that I'm already sort of writing about it generally, he tells me that actually he's not a Brit at all, but he's a Polish Jew, and all his family were killed in the Holocaust. And so it was like, I sat down and explained to him, 
Oh, as if we don't have enough identity issues already. You've got to layer this. I mean, how do, you know, and I'm already a middle-aged man with my own kids, but and it's sort of, I'm not sure I have headroom for this. You know, I just want to sort of file its way on my you know, psychological to-do list and get back to it later. But, and so, but in many ways, though, it, was, um, um, uh, you know, it helped me to understand why he wouldn't leave, that Zimbabwe was his refuge, that, he, you know, that, that it was their sanctuary. And it was, you know, and and I think with many, you know, many Zimbabweans, I mean, the whole idea of, of you know, I have had lots of discussions about, you know, is there such a thing as a white African, a white African oxymoron, you know, it, are we just sort of remnants of, of something else? And and it's, a, you know, the whole idea of when you become a nationality, and indeed, how important really is it, you know? And my whole my whole attitude towards. Um, identity has changed since I've been living in America. I've lived in New York for the last 15 years. I mean, I've been based in there. And when you're in somewhere like New York, where you know well over 50% of New York is from somewhere else, and no one gives a shit. You know, it's just we all got funny surnames to each other, and we come from places where when we were back there, we were sort of Serbs, and you know, and Bosnians would be shooting at each other. But in New York, we were shopping together and doing this. That, that you sort of start to realise that. In a globalized world, more and more, you know, many of us have got have got multiply hyphenated identities, and it stops. You know, we're not in 19th century nationalism anymore, and it doesn't matter as much. Even if as we sit under the shadow of oh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 we, 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 the woman who gave us the wind. We, we sit. We sit under the. This is the, the genius of British self mythologizing. Here we are. We're like in the, of the belly of the beast, we are in the heart of the cake, of the wedding cake. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you open up, you know, we have probably a few questions, anything that you guys want to ask? Come, yes. Well, I mean, essentially, no one's going to invest in a country where property rights in general aren't secure. So there's almost no foreign investment. So, for example, it's not just land, but there's a new indigenization policy which says that any company of any size at all, right down to very small ones, have got to be more than got to be at least 51% um, indigenous owned. And the definition of indigenous is previously disadvantaged. So essentially non non whites is what it is. And you I mean the, in fact what happens instead of instead of it benefiting the indigenous, the, the, the investment just tends to dry up. I mean that's the practical reality of it. They did find, I mean the timing of it sucks, they found just as, as Mugabe and Zana PFS party were kind of coming to the end, they suddenly discovered um, what they still think might be the biggest find of Amelia diamonds in history in the world. Um, and that, that, again, instead of that, that, those diamonds and that money coming into the fiscus, coming into the, you know, the general, the general budget, um, Chinese companies, particularly military companies from China, from the Chinese military, came in and um, are mining it in uh, conditions of huge secrecy. And most of those diamonds are just going straight out of the country with um, just the elite in the party, in the ruling party, benefiting. Um, I mean, you know, there are other there are there are other mineral things. It's not like Angola or Nigeria where there's you know huge oil, you know, that, you know or in South Africa as it used to be where there was gold and then gold is, is no longer the linchpin of the economy. So it should by rights be um, a wealthy country, but it's always it's always been a mixed economy rather than just a sort of resource extraction economy. So the rods made his money on the way. Cecil Rhodes, well he didn't in fact. Cecil Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes went up to, to Rhodesia um, thinking that they were going to find gold um, and diamonds and found neither. And so it, in the end ended up, it, it, in the, those prospectors of people who went up ended up farming. Um, which was actually, I mean to the country, you know, was better for the economy overall. But, but they didn't, I mean that was, they thought they would find that this would be the great new gold fields and it was a huge disappointment. Questions? 
Godwin, sir, you uh, said that you were a, first you thought you were a Brit living in Zimbabwe, then you found out you were a Polish Jew, now you have been living in New York. So, have you ever felt a sense of uprooting, maybe like Silas Khan? Have you ever felt that you've never belonged anywhere, or have you always been uh, satisfied with where you've been? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an, an Anglo-African Ashkenazi. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> You know, the triple A, the triple A, exactly. Um, um, I mean, you know, no, I think that that I don't. I, I mean, I tell you what, I do feel now, rightly or wrongly. I feel like I'm a New Yorker. I'm, I'm not an American. I mean, I don't sound like an American or whatever. But but I do feel that I, I'm, I feel at home in New York. But that's really a kind of attitude. It's a state of mind as much as anything else. And when I go back to England, you know, which, where I wasn't growing up, I mean, when I first went to England for the first time, it was very bizarre. It was like seeing it through the wrong end of the telescope, all these little houses crowded together, and and kind of dull and robin. And, and everybody on the subway looked so cross, and they were all sort of pinched and red-faced, and, you know, first capillaries. And it was just very sort of, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the glories of empire. It was something totally different. And, and, uh, and so, and yet when I go back to Zimbabwe now, it's so mortally wounded, I, I almost don't recognize it. But most, most sort of tragically in Zimbabwe, I don't recognize the culture anymore. What happens when you put people in that position for 20 years, where nothing works and it's so corrupt, they become feral. They become, you know, they, they lose their honor. They lose, they're just in survival mode and they're just, you know, they really become feral and it's, it's really, it's very, um, um, it's awful to see, and it's very unattractive, and it's just, it's, it's very dispiriting and degrading for, for everyone. So, I mean, I think, you know, and then bear in mind, I was a foreign correspondent for 20 years, so I was for a long time just on the road in Eastern Europe or the rest of Africa or wherever. So, um, so eventually, I mean, the good side of it is that you start to see the commonalities in places rather than the differences, you know. So, I mean, I end up, I mean, this is going to sound slightly kind of naive, but I find that I end up feeling a little bit at home everywhere. I mean, yeah, I've been in India for two weeks, and I started to feel really at home here, yeah, you know. I recognize all sorts of things about India, you know, partly because of, you know, shared history and one thing and another, but, you know, you, you start to see and realize that we've all got much more in common than, than um, things that differentiate us. You, you might have that. Yeah, well, since you brought up that at home in India, and your father is in other regions. Yes, I mean, the, the, what, what happened to my father was that when he realized he was dying, he, um, he asked me to promise him one thing. He said, can you just make sure that I'm cremated? I don't want to be buried. I don't want worms eating my body. I want to be cremated. So when he died, I, I, when he was ill, I, finally, I got on the plane and rushed back, and he died while I was in the air. And trying to organize the, the actual funeral was a real logistical um, headache. It was like you know, petrol for cars, and, it was just, and I was concentrating on that. And then um, uh, there'd been no electricity for several days, and, I, and there was no phone. The phone wasn't working, and I got a, a, a note from the undertaker saying that, that their morgue, mortuary, had been um, was working on a backup diesel generator, and they'd now run out of diesel. No more diesel in the country, and so the temperature was rising, and the bodies, all the bodies, had to be disposed of in the next 24 hours. Otherwise, they would be put into a central mass grave, the pauper's grave outside of town. So I rushed to the crematorium to say, you know, can you make sure you can do this? Can we do this? I need to do it in 24 hours. And they said, no, no, they don't have any butane, and so they weren't working either. And there was no way they could do it. So I felt sort of ridiculously, you know, the one thing my father had asked me to promise his whole life, pretty much, and I was unable to deliver. And so in desperation, I went to the president of the Zimbabwe Hindu Society and said, can I cremate him? Because, you know, and they said, no, we, we aren't allowed to cremate white people. We got into trouble doing it. Someone else tried it. We can't. And so I said, oh, I've come all the way from New York to so any way we can around this. And eventually, he said, well, there's a one way. He said, we, we would have to convert him. And I sort of said, well, he's dead. He said, well, no, I think, you know, apparently, I mean, I don't know much about Hinduism, but, you know, with the 
with reincarnation of one thing and another, you know, so that's not really a barrier in Hindu. So I said, fine, so let's do it. So we converted my father to Hinduism ex post facto, ex post mortem. Um, so that, and, then, and then I said, great, you know, where shall I bring the bodies that you can, um, you can cremate it? He said, no, 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 you have to do it, it's the eldest son. So they taught me how to do it, and actually it's quite complicated with wood that burns at different, you know, I had no idea. They should. So we built a pyre at the, this place in the Pioneer Cemetery in Harare, where, where it's, which is reserved for the Hindu um, cremations, and and cremated it. So that was so, that was, so my father was born a Jew, lived an Anglican, and died a Hindu. Um, I think on that note, is there any other last question before I go? I think there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, would you find some parallels between? The 1984 massacre and Operation Blue Star here in India. Yeah, I mean, it's different. You know, I, I don't know enough about about the, the, that operation. I mean, I do think in Zimbabwe, what it was, um, it, it was. I mean, in a sense, it was a very seminal moment in Zimbabwe's history. I think because it was. It was a recognition that um, there was no room for um, opposition, peaceful opposition politics, if you know what I mean. And so, in that sense, I think it was worse. It was a sort of recognition that this wasn't really going to be a pluralistic society in that sense. It was going to be an effectively a one, a one party state, which is what it then became. So, you know, I think it was a, it was a, it was a kind of fork, a much more of a fork in the road in Zimbabwe, where where real democratic structures hadn't been created, where civic society wasn't really developed, you didn't have en enough institutions, all these other institutions that we forget, well, I mean, I'm not saying you forget, one forgets that democracy depends on just as much as actual political parties and things, all of these other things that are required you know, to prop up a pluralistic, tolerant society. And we're going to have, oh, stop it. We were growing up and later in the army, very danger of being killed ever. When you were growing up, later in the army, where you were in the danger of being killed. Um, y yes, I mean, I, I, I sort of volunteered from, for everything from the laundry corps to, I mean, everything that would make me be in a non-combat situation. Um, and I've, I mean, I've written about this in the, in the first book. Um, what, what happened to me, and it's, a, it's, it's interesting and troubling, bear in mind that I was 17 when I went in and turned 18 while I was in the army, that um, it was a very brutal war and um, the insurgents were in a hurry and there was, a, the, like most of these wars, most of the people being killed were not combatants on either side, they were civilians. Um, and I did end up in, in I did end up in combat um, and I did end up sort of witnessing um, uh, you know, shocking things um, shocking things that insurgents have done. Uh, and you do reach a point where you wonder I mean you just think that the ends can never justify these means. I mean, that you, if you actually see something like that, some of the things, it's very, and at 18, it was something that, you know, I, and, you know, what the, the British style of military, the, what the genius of it is that it divides you up into regiments and things, and, and, and your primary loyalty ends up being to your unit and being to the other men in your unit and the, the speed of core of a particular thing, and that's, and mostly just, wanting to survive, I suppose. So, yes, I mean, it was an extraordinary experience for me at 18, um, and I reached a point where I thought, I, also, I was working with black soldiers exclusively, so I would be for months and months and months at a time out in the bush, just exclusively with, with, with black soldiers, um, and the, the world outside receded and got further and further away, and any other context sort of just disappeared. And then I suddenly, after that, I did finally get released. So, um, my father had been petitioning the Ministry of Defence, and I was in combat on a sort of Wednesday. On a Friday, I was flying back to Bulawayo, got a train up to Harare, 
flew to Cambridge and Tuesday morning I was in law lectures in Cambridge and I was looking for my rifle and you know everybody in Cambridge was sort of riding around on sort of old fashioned bicycles with wicker baskets and long white scarves and I was just you know, I had no idea where I was and it was the most sort of gear crunching thing and I was just sort of glad to be alive. We're very glad you made it and uh, thank you very much for joining us.